It's nearly five past, so I'd um, like to make uh, a start. Uh, we're getting in now to uh, the real optics part of the course. That's what we're going to be studying for the next couple of weeks. So before we get into the details, I'd like to give you a brief sort of overview of what we mean by optics in this course. And um, I mentioned this once already, but uh, I think it, it bears repeating that um, we, although in principle we've unified everything from gamma rays, where we're talking about uh, wavelengths of the order of nuclear uh, dimensions, 10 to the minus 15 of a metre, correspondingly we've got oscillations at 10 to the 23 hertz. And down here, from if you like, the, the light part, this is a logarithmic scale, and the light part of the spectrum is, of course, a tiny bit of the electromagnetic spectrum between 10 to the minus 7 and 10 to the minus 6 metres. And all the way, once we go into the ultraviolet and X-rays and gamma rays, the individual photons have got a lot of energy. And so the quantum picture absolutely cannot be neglected in that regime. So I take these slightly out uh, of order here just to emphasise that if you like, if the photon energies are large compared with the energy sensitivity of the equipment, we can't study that with a classical uh, wave theory. Because, uh, you know, if you like, if uh, the whole idea of a wave, let's take a sinusoidal wave, it's spread out in space. So the idea of locating all the energy of a wave, if you like, at a point, the point-type particle, is beyond what we study in EMO. And of course, you're doing you know, quantum physics this year, you've got more advanced quantum physics next year, and if you're doing the four-year course, you can do advanced quantum mechanics and further quantum mechanics. You know, there's 72 lectures available, 36 on um, core quantum physics and another 36 which are available as choices in the fourth year and obviously this is completely vital for studying atomic physics and nuclear physics. I mean if we've got and then, you know, like any kind of set of discrete energy levels and let's say we've got a photon emitted when something drops down from one energy level to say the ground state we know that E is equal to HF. We're going to have a specific lumpiness to the radiation that we get from atomic and nuclear systems. And this is not studied in EMO. So uh, we, we remember this is a classical wave theory. We've got continuously varying uh, electric and magnetic fields. Now, likewise, at the other end uh, uh, of things, it's not just um, that we have, uh, we, that we're going to cover everything. So if both the wavelengths involved are very small compared with the dimensions of the equipment and the photon energies are small. So in other words, now we can have the situation where the photon energies are quite small. And you, of course, we can apply a classical theory to the system. But if the wavelengths are very small compared with the dimensions of the equipment, so let's say, for example, we're shining a light through a barn door. Well, the wavelength of the light is between 10 to the minus 7 and 10 to the minus 6 of a metre, and the barn door's a couple of metres wide. Well, in effect, then, all that we get is a geometric shadow of the barn door. Light is travelling in straight lines, in effect. And we'd be using a hammer to crack a walnut if we applied uh, Maxwell's th uh, electromagnetic theory of light if the dimensions are small compared with the dimensions of the equipment. So this is the uh, regime of geometrical optics or ray optics. And also, we're not going to study that because basically, if in effect the light is just travelling in straight lines, um, we can handle it by simpler techniques, you know, like ray diagrams and so on. And again, I'm not saying this isn't important. Of course it is. If you want to design a telescope or a microscope using a system of lenses, that's very important. And uh, particularly if you're doing astrophysics, you know, Phil's course on astronomical optics and high energy observational astronomy, understanding ray optics is important. And of course, if you're doing the experimental course, applications of optics, which is combined with high energy physics in 
in that another course taken by Phil, you'll be studying this. If you're doing TP or you're doing maths and physics and physics and philosophy, you won't um, take on this at all. But there's loads of good books where you can learn, you know, it's in essence ray diagrams. That's all there is to it. I mean, you can get some quite complicated and interesting problems, but you just solve it by drawing lots of straight lines. So there's not, uh, we, we're not studying the whole of optics at one go. What we're calling optics in this course is sometimes called physical optics. And now the wavelengths involved are comparable to the dimensions. So for example, we've got two radio transmitters which are transmitting at 300 meters. Uh, you know, we, uh, Lander has, we, we've used this example before of, you know, just kind of like uh, the, the radio, if Lambda is 300 metres, a sort of medium wave band on the radio, and our frequency therefore is of the order of a megahertz. Obviously we're always preserving that C is F Lambda is 3 times 10 to the 8 metres a second. Well, if the masts are 10 or 20 metres apart, we now do have to consider their interference. Similarly, we can organise that with light by shining a plane wave onto two slits, which then act as secondary sources, you know, the Young's double slit experiment. And then we might have the slits, say, 5 times 10 to the minus 4 metres apart, and when we shine a laser onto those, the two sources interfere with each other, and a lot of you will have done that in a first year lab experiment. Again, the photon energies are still small. And indeed, in a Young's double slit experiment, and again, I'm sure, although it's not sort of directly uh, part of you know, what we're doing here, the, the purely experimental side, you know that if you have Young's double slits, you get some discrete lobes of scattering come through the double slits due to the interference effect that we're going to start studying today. And if you do this experiment very carefully, and this was first done in Japan, but it's now almost standard photon optics. People are so good at that. The first photon might arrive here, the next photon here, the next photon here, the next photon here, and so on. Again, the lumpiness of the arrival of the photons we won't get, but certainly we'll be able to calculate the overall pattern that when a billion photons have arrived, they'll have this very characteristic pattern. So we're in a very particular regime. The dimensions of the equipment are comparable with the wavelength of the radiation, but we're still in the regime where the photon energies themselves are relatively small, and this is what we get called physical optics, and this is what we're going to study um, by applying the classical theory of electromagnetic radiation. So we're not, you can't do, if you like, the whole of optics at one go. Uh, and when I remember, wh when I'm talking in, 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 in the next couple of weeks about these, uh, so we're now at the low end. The light end is now off this, and here's the infrared, the far infrared, millimetre waves, ultra high frequencies. And of course you see here TV, TV, FM radio, AM radio, going right down to very low frequencies, audio and power frequencies, and are literally, of course, operating at 50 hertz. So it will be a comparison of the wavelength of the radiation with the dimensions of the equipment that we're looking at. So if we've got Young's double slit experiment, we've got quite short wavelengths, but we've got the slits very close together. If we're looking at radio masts, they're going to be several metres apart, and so on. So uh, that's the kind of phenomena that we're looking at. And again, it's jumping slightly ahead, but in particular, this is uh, figure 75 of the course handout. This is the difference between rectilinear propagation, which is the uh, physicist's way for saying light travels in straight lines. You know, think of some difficult words for something easy. Well, obviously, if you've just got a great big wall and you've got a hole next to it, you know, you've, you, your open barn door, we well, of course, you just form a geometrical shadow. The light doesn't get through the barn, uh, <coughs> does get through the open barn door, but it doesn't get through the rest of the barn. 
it gets absorbed by the wall and we get a geometrical shadow. And as I say, we're, we're not going to really bother with this side of things. Obviously, if you have an opaque disc, it forms a shadow. If you have a circular aperture, you get a light uh, aperture and everything else is blocked out. But if the dimensions of your aperture are of the order of the wavelength, you do get diffraction patterns. And the, so you can see here, particularly as we come down to study, and we'll be doing this next week, uh, a slit. And this width of the slit A, let's say, is three wavelengths of the radiation, we get a series of bands of brightness. Likewise, if the slit is five times the wavelength of the radiation, we get the geometrical shadow nearly in the darkness, but we it approaches rectilinear propagation, but we still get diffraction effects. Uh, yeah, sure. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, sure. So, uh, what we're dealing with is um, these sort of regime where the, the, the dimensions are of the order of magnitude of the wavelength in a very, very, a very rough way. So, first of all, um, again, I'm, I apologize for this style, and that is, you know, I'm very, you know, we're very short of blackboards in here, and by the time I keep, you know, writing and rubbing out, I think it will just interrupt the flow, especially if I use that one just for some, some odd sketches. So what I'm going to do, as I've done in here before, it's not ideal, but uh, I'm going to kind of go through, walk through the lecture notes and uh, what they're all about rather than keep writing. So, of course, these are available uh, on the VLE, and um, you you, you can, uh, it's up to you if you want to take notes as you go along during the lecture, but, uh, and I'll try and pace it you know, as if I was writing. The first statement is one that I already mentioned, that an ordinary light source, like, for example, this light bulb, here is giving off little bursts of photons. And a typical uh, burst of photons might be 1 to 10 nanoseconds. That's the kind of time scale. And, uh, and so you get this nice sort of coherent wave, which is lasting for a few nanoseconds, but then a, a completely new wave train, which is, may have any random phase compared with the original one, gets emitted. And that gives us a lot of averaging problems that we leave to the engineers, of course, because we're going to solve the easy problems because we're physicists. So there is, however, fortunately for us, a physical system which really corresponds to the approximations that we're doing, which is lasers. And lasers, light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, you'll be studying in atomic physics as you'll follow up to the quantum physics this year, and the more advanced courses on lasers, you have this coherent wave train just goes on and on and on. And remember, light's oscillating at 10 to the 15 hertz when we're in the, the, that regime because of the matching of C equals F lambda. And so it, a laser pulse might last over a second. And so there's 10 to the 15 oscillations that are all perfectly in phase with each other. And so now, actually, our approximations uh, of this sort of well-defined polarisation and phase are actually good approximations for a laser. And likewise, if we've got two radio masts next to each other, uh, we can control the radiation by deliberately driving the electrons up and down with our LCR circuits, our signal generation is, is controlled. We can also have this well-defined polarisation and phase. So that's what we're going to be studying. First of all, before we do any maths whatsoever, is to say the case where we don't get interference. And that's illustrated in figure 59 of the course handout. Now, it's good lecture theatre for getting lumbago if you're an old lecturer here. I'm going to kneel down to this one. The, this source and this source are at right angles to each other, and we measure at some distant point the net electric field produced by these two forces. You get no interference at all. Source two, the electric field, remember we're driving electrons up and down here, so we get a 
polarised wave at the, any point because we're just uh, driving things up and down in this plane. In here, in source one, we're driving them horizontally, so this produces also a horizontally polarised um, electromagnetic wave at this point, and the resultant R is just obtained by simple vector addition of these two things. So in other words, if I've got a source where I'm driving electrons up and down a wire like this, and a source where I'm driving them like this, everywhere in the lecture theatre, let's say I drive them with equal amplitudes, you will simply measure an electric field which has got this direction and which is obtained by simple vector addition of these two things. Perpendicular polarisation of these two waves gives no interference at all. So <clears throat> I'd like to, I will make a board note on that because uh, that's something that uh, I don't think is in the, the lecture notes for this lecture. And to say that sources with perpendicular polarisation, in other words, the polarisation of one is, let's say, on the y axis, the other's on the z axis, and they travel out in the x direction, sources with po perpendicular polarisation do not, emphatically not, let's underline it, interfere with each other. There's no interference in this case. And uh, that's illustrated in figure 59 of the course handout. So in this case, we just get vector addition of the two waves. And again, I, I just, uh, I mean, it's worth uh, restating that in this case, if, say, these two waves had equal amplitude but perpendicular polarisation, the length of this vector would just be root 2 compared with this amplitude and this amplitude, and its direction would be at exactly 45 degrees to both of them. So this is a case where things don't interfere. So what we're actually interested in, and when we talk about interference, is when I drive electrons up and down two antennae with parallel polarisation. So now I've got two sources and I'm driving electrons up and down these two sources. The waves have now got the same polarisation and they do interfere with each other. And what do we mean by interference? Well, um, <clears throat> again, just to lead in to what we're doing, the interference of two sources with, and again, maybe underline it, parallel polarisation um, is illustrated in figs, fig, well, two figures really, 60 and 62 of the course handout. So I'll come to those uh, in just a minute. So we've... Uh, so um, it's just to, to make sure that everyone realises the, the, the kind of geometry of the problem that we're studying. So let's actually get to these figures, hopefully. Here we go. So what is being illustrated here is to emphasise this is the top view. We're looking down on source S1 and source S2. In other words, we're looking down, in this figure, we're looking down on them and we're seeing what's, how the radiation spreads out in this plane. Now, clearly, let's just say these two sources, there's one nice vertical source, probably something here I, I could, oh yes, there we go, there's another vertical source here. And we've got the electrons oscillating up and down in these two sources. Now, there are two ways that the phase of the oscillations can differ for where you are in the lecture theatre. Let's say at first I drive them in phase. So in other words, the electron, as it's going up here, is going up here 
at exactly the same time. So in other words, we can have, if you like, an inherent phase difference between the oscillators. The, the case we'll consider most, excuse all the, the background stuff here, is when they're driven exactly in phase. So in other words, I deliberately say I'm controlling it. And this would be indeed the case with the Young's double slit experiment. If I send a plane wave and then it passes through two slits, because the plane wave is arriving at the two slits simultaneously, this laser light, particularly the laser case, remember, this laser light arrives, it's come from here, yeah, it's produced, we're in a plane wave approximation, it arrives and it hits the two slits simultaneously. So therefore, we have coherent and in-phase sources. But the, it, 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 I think it's intuitively obvious to you that if you happen to be exactly down the middle of the lecture theatre, there can't be any path difference between the two because your distance, if you're dead down the middle of the lecture theatre to these two sources, is always the same. So if you like, you're clearly... Uh, blackboards, there we go. Uh, <coughs> if... It, if we represent the two sources here and here and we're on the middle, it doesn't matter where we are on the middle, we've travelled the same distance here and here, the same distance here and here, the same distance here and here, they're going to always add up in phase. But if you're out at some angle, this, the, you, the distance travelled from this source is different to the distance travelled from this source and you may or may not get constructive or destructive interference, which is precisely the maths that we're going to do. So what we're going to do is, uh, remember our detector will also just be a wire, if you like, if go back to radio waves, will also just be a wire. Well, what's my wire going to pick up here, given that there's a certain distance there and a certain distance there, and I'm going to move my detector, always in this orientation, looking down this top view, I'm going to move my detector around to different points, and I want to know, I want to add the waves up at these different points. And uh, so that, to do that mathematically is not difficult, uh, and I'm going to do it two ways. In the problem class um, this afternoon, no, no, later this morning, excuse me, I'm going to do it um, with complex exponentials, as illustrated here, and I'm going to um, do it with cosine functions today. I prefer the complex exponentials, but a lot of optics books will add cosine functions. So it's worth, and you know, you should be fluent in adding cosines, you should be fluent in adding complex exponentials. It's good to be able to do it in two different ways. Well now, let's make it quantitative. Remember, it's the phase difference. When it arrives at you, this, this would be complete constructive interference because we've got precisely every trough and every crest matching each other. I could, however, have the other extreme case where I've got, again, excuse the, let me just make this a bit cleaner. Uh, I could have the extreme opposite case where this wave arrives exactly out of phase, and now I get complete destructive interference. The crests of this one exactly match the troughs of the other wave. I can always choose the origin. I can always shift my origin around as I please for one wave, but then I've got a phase difference the other wave. And of course, the <coughs> it's the phase difference between the waves that counts. So let's say I choose this one to arbitrarily have zero phase. It's got some amplitude. Again, sometimes you'll see this just written as A for amplitude. Sometimes you'll see it written as E naught, the magnitude of the electric field vector. And similarly, if you like, the, the reason why I quite like the, the just saying A is that this would be the amplitude of the electric field vector of source 1, and this would be the electric amplitude of the field vector of source 2, and so we kind of end up with a double subscript, whereas it's much easier to just say, well, this one could be A1 and this one could be A2. Needless to say, because we're, again, doing mathematically simple approximations, I'll often choose these amplitudes to be identical in the two cases. Well, now, if you're out at some angle theta, 
the wave that's travelled from the source, let's say, and again, this, this point P now is distant. Again, in the spirit, we know in reality, if we're very close to the sources, there will be a finite curvature to the wave front. And so, if we represent that kind of finite curvature, then let's say these, these two sources we know are really, even in the equatorial plane, let's forget the complications of the, of the, uh, of the full dipole radiation. In the equatorial plane, they will be producing some kind of curve wave front. But the further and further we get, let's just take one source to begin with, the further we get away from it, well, the radius of curvature is becoming such that this is pretty much a straight line. So, in other words, the plane wave approximation is going to work at a distant point P. So, it wouldn't actually, the plane wave approximation wouldn't work too well where Cameron is or it's getting better where James is, but by the time we get right up to where Michael is in the corner there, we have got a very good approximation that we're distant because this distance between the sources is very small compared with the distance where you are up in the top corner there. So, in that case, we can really apply the plane wave approximation. And we, you can see quite clearly that the wave that has travelled from this source to get up to the top corner, which is at some angle theta to the bisector, the line that bisects the sources, so in other words, it, it, we know we're going to get coherent interference all the way down the middle. Well, at this distant point P, it's just geometry to say if this angle is theta, and the distance d is d between the two sources, well, this wave has travelled an extra distance, d sine theta. You know, it's travelled an extra distance. So, first of all, let's consider that we drive them in phase. In other words, we have uh, the two electron systems being driven in an identical phase. They, the waves have still travelled a, a different distance. So... If the oscillators are driven in phase, the phase difference between the waves at P is just due to this extra distance, X, that they've travelled. Yeah? So, um, the wave, uh, again, we've got now, we, we're going to uh, use, as I say, we're going to write it in two different ways. This phase, excuse me too, I, I took a lot of stuff from Hecht's textbook on optics in which the phase is often written as phi. I've taken some diagrams from the Feynman lectures in which the phase difference is written as alpha. So just be a bit uh, careful with that. But um, if, if I represent cos kx minus omega t plus uh, phi as it's written, I'm afraid, on the lecture notes I'm going to use, or e to the i kx minus omega t plus phi, if there's no inherent distance, in other words, if, if the, the, the two oscillators are being driven at an identical phase at the origin, and I add a wave like this to a wave like this, I have only got the extra distance travelled, which puts them out of phase. The phase difference just becomes e to the i k x. And so, <coughs> if you like now, this extra fa this phase difference between the two... Os this is the phase difference here between the two oscillators, is just kx. That's what they've been shifted by. But we know that x is d sine theta. And we know that k, in this nice one-dimensional plane wave approximation, is just 2 pi over lambda. So we can say straight away that the phase difference is 2 pi over lambda d sine theta. Yeah? That's just simple trig. If, but if that's the case, well, if that happens to be equal to 2 pi m, where m is any integer at all, the waves have come back into phase. At first, as, well, as I move away from this... Per I know in the perpendicular line between the two oscillators, everything's adding up in phase, yeah? If I move slightly away, so I go through Sam there and so on, and, and out to, uh, through Lucy, you know, and it goes out in this direction, well, the oscillations will go more and more out of phase. So there's my first wave, the, if you like, source one, let's make the yellow one. I now shift this along a bit. 
because I've travelled a little bit of extra distance. I shift it along a bit more, but by the time I've shifted the phase by any integer, in this case what I'm illustrating is n, oh sorry, m I've called it there, m equals to 1, any integer times 2 pi, well of course all the crests are on top of each other again. If I've moved the phase by an integral number of wavelengths, or in other words, I move it by any integral <coughs> multiple of 2 pi, well, they're, they're back constructively interfering with each other again. So if I get the... Uh, and sorry, I, I, I put this in brackets here because the, there is a... Di you know, as I say in the notes, sometimes I've used phi from the Hecht and sometimes alpha from the Feynman. If this phase difference, which by trig is 2 pi over lambda d sine theta, is equal to 2 pi times m, well obviously these 2 pi's cancel and I get cross multiplying d sine theta is m lambda. So if theta is 2 pi m, we get the constructive interference that d sine theta is m lambda. And again, this is why you can see d and lambda have got to be comparable to be in the physical optics regime. Because otherwise, if we had, well, for, you know, again, clearly rearranging this, if I just want to know the angles at which I, I get, con of course I get constructive interference when theta is equal to zero, because then all the, uh, zero, if I count that as one of the integers, well, clearly that's just going down the middle of the lecture theatre, but then it gets less and less intense. When I go through pi radians, I've got a minimum, two pi, I've got a maximum, three pi a minimum, four pi a maximum, and they'll be defined by sine theta is equal to m, any integral multiple of lambda over d, and you can see immediately, well, sine theta, you know, it, can't, it can't be greater than 1. So if this wavelength divided by d is greater than 1, I'm not going to get the interference effects at all. And likewise, if lambda over d is really tiny, everything's going to be, all the interference is going to be compressed at very small angles. So uh, that gives you... Um, in fact, we've, we, we've solved the problem, and again, I'm sure that's a formula you will have learned before, is that d sine theta is n lambda is the um, criterion for constructive interference. So let's now run through, as I say, it's, uh, I'll now run through how we, how we just do all the maths. And again, I've, uh, uh, I've uh, just sort of outlined the equations in red. Well, of course... Uh, the electric, what we're really studying is an electric field that's a function of position and time and we're just going to do sinusoidal variations in the next sort of 20 minutes with cosines and so this would be the inherent phase. Now remember I can, if I choose, I could drive this oscillator up while I'm driving this oscillator down. In other words, I can make the sources deliberately out of phase by pi for example, it could make them any arbitrary phase. But now, this one is always producing a wave, if you like, with electrical polarisation down when this one is up. So now when I go down the middle line of the lecture theatre, I always get destructive interference. They're always going to cancel each other out. And so I do have to include this inherent type of phase factor and, I, and this is what gives us the different... So if you like, this is the inherent phase of the, uh, of the oscillation and this is the difference, the, the phase produced by the distance travelled. So there are two possibilities. And what we usually do, and again, I'm only going to do amplitude modulation. Of course, you can add up waves of different frequencies. But again, I'm going to add up waves of the same frequency. And, uh, you know, you know perfectly well that if you've got a laser hitting two slits and you've, let's say, lambda 650 nanometers, that's, you know, a typical red laser, you know, quite a good value for either a helium-neon laser or a lot of solid-state lasers, then um, you're going to have a... <coughs> you, you really will have the, um, the phases um, determined. And... This, in that case, for the Young's double slit where we illuminate with a plane wave, that will be zero. And, of course, that's when you get really easy formulae. But it's got to be in there because we might want to create some special effects. So 
the maths in cos with you, you'll see why we why we use complex exponentials when we have five or six sources, which are, I'll come to later this morning. It, it's actually very easy to do if you've got two sources, because if you've got uh, two waves, there's the electric field of wave one. Remember, I've amalgamated. I'm just saying that they arrive with different phases. This can now be due to the difference distance travelled or the inherent phase of the oscillations. Again, it's slightly awkward, this E01, but in other words, it's, that's the amplitude E0 of wave 1, which is then a cosine type sinusoidal variation, similar for wave 2. Well, the Maxwell equations are linear. So to get the resultant electric field at any point, I just add them up. So all that I've got to do in the interference of two sources is add up two cosines. And again, precisely because we want to bring out the physics without worrying too much about the maths, I'm going to basically let them have the same amplitude because then all I've got to do is add up A into cosine omega t plus phi 1 plus inside the bracket because they're equal amplitudes cos omega t plus phi 2. Note that the omega is the same. You know, we're shining red laser light, so it's got the same frequency, or we're driving our two antennae with the same frequency. Well, again, that's it. All we've got to do is add up these two amplitudes. And the resultant is, is these two amplitudes added up. And all we've got to do, well, we know that cos A plus cos B, which is what we're adding up inside the brackets, is twice the cos of half the sum of the angles times the cos of half the difference. So simple trigonometric relationship reduces this resultant uh, amplitude to 2a cos phi 1 minus phi 2 and into the cos of omega t plus a half phi 1 plus a half phi 2. So this composite wave, it's harmonic, it's still oscillating at omega t, and we'd be quite surprised if we oscillated, you know, like we had a red laser illuminating two sources and we started seeing blue or green light at the back, you know, just doesn't happen. Of course, it's still harmonic, it's still red light. Or if we had two radio antennae driving at one megahertz, all of the radiation in the room would be still oscillating at one megahertz. So the composite wave is harmonic, it's got the same frequency as the constituents, but of course it's got a new phase and a new amplitude. And the <coughs> you can see the resultant phase is the average of the two phases, and the resultant amplitude is given by this factor, 2a cos a half phi 1 minus phi 2. So we've got now a way, this is the, if you like, this is just the average phase, isn't it, here? This is just phi 1 plus phi 2 halves. So we've got a, 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 a new a new. <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, a new phase, the new amplitude. This is just the average, the resultant phase, and this is the amplitude of what you get at any point in the room. And as I said, it's, it's quite straight. The note here, it's straightforward to solve for the general case, but it's just more tedious algebra, obviously. If, a, if A1 and A2 are different, you have to do more algebra. But uh, it doesn't give you anything new in the physics. And that's treated, this is the book I recommend for the optics part of the course, is Hecht's book on optics. And, uh, of course, it's much easier to use the complex exponential method when you've got different uh, sources. So this, remember, is the amplitude at any point, yeah? This is the amplitude. The intensity, again, I mentioned this before, it's true for any wave. I gave the exact formula, which we'll derive later in the course. The intensity is proportional to the square of the amplitude. Now, almost always, almost always, we're interested in the amount of light. In other words, the intensity. Uh, which in the end is the number of photons, although we can't calculate it in that discrete way, that's effectively what it amounts to. So we're actually interested in the intensity, and I mentioned this in the last lecture, for light in particular, the intensity is called the irradiance, you know, how much radiation do we get at a certain point. 
And um, let, so let's look at the answer. That we, we know the amplitude, all we've got to do is square it. And you can see if the phase difference is zero, this is cos of zero, it's one, the amplitude is double, you know, they've added up in phase, so the intensity is four times, yeah? The intense, and that's why we call it interference. We're not by any means contravening conservation of energy because there are other parts of the room where there's no amplitude at all. Of course, the, you know, the radiation doesn't disappear, but nor does it enhance. It enhances in certain directions and it cancels out in others. If these are 90 degrees out of phase, then, of course, the cosine of pi halves is zero and we get no resultant amplitude. So the amplitude, the minima have got to be zeros and the maxima have got to be fours in some kind of units. So that's what is illustrated. Uh, again, this isn't part of the, the course handout. If the, uh, the two oscillators are driven with no inherent difference, then of course the line between them is is we get the, the maximums, which in, in this analogy is just down the middle of the lecture theatre. And of course, if they are exactly, in this case, this is to make it visually easier, let's say they're half a wavelength apart. Well, if I go out on this line, the two waves, never, they, they just remain always half a wavelength apart as they translate out in this direction. So, of course, if they're driven in phase and that distance is half a wavelength, in other words, I start them out in this way with the crests and the troughs here. Well, of course, as the wave propagates at the speed of light, the two always cancel out along this line. And so along the line of the two oscillators, I get zero. And uh, I leave it to you to work out it's very straightforward where the um, ratio would be two. So, you know, here I am in York and I've got a couple of antennae. Uh, well, with this arrangement, all I could do is broadcast to kind of Lancaster and uh, there's ooh, Lancaster over there and Scarborough. Yeah. And I'm sending absolutely no radiation to Edinburgh or London. Yeah. Um, I might want to broadcast to Edinburgh and London, they're bigger places. Well, I don't want to move to blood, bloody enormous great masts, do I? So, you know, I don't want to kind of think, oh, I've got to broadcast to London. I'll dig up this enormous radio antenna and put it half a wavelength over here. You know, that's a lot of work. But it's much easier to say, well, I'll just drive that one up while I drive that one down. I'll make the f inherent phase difference between the two oscillators pi. And now I get complete cancellation from between uh, Lancaster and Scarborough and all the radiation goes to Edinburgh and London and then, you know, somewhere over in Lincolnshire or up there in Whitby, you know, I get somewhere in between. Yeah. Now, case A is the one we study most. Because again, you know, remember, if I, if I illuminate two slits with a plane wave, I guarantee that I'm going to drive the oscillators in phase. In this case, we come back to this case that if uh, 2 pi d sine theta over lambda is the phase difference, if they're in phase, uh, then phi has got to be 2 pi times an integer and then I get this nice simple formula, d sine theta is m lambda. But I put this up to, to remind you that this, this case that you normally see, and that's the kind of like A-level formula that we learn, only applies to when the oscillators are driven in phase. We can now treat the more general case of when they're driven at arbitrary phase. And indeed, you, might, you can create special effects. You might kind of think, well... You know, I really don't like those people down in London. I just don't want to send any radiation to them whatsoever. I want to send a little bit to, you know, S Scarborough, a little bit to Lancaster, but I'm really interested in, in broadcasting to Scotland. Well, then, I just make the inherent phase difference between the two, neither, um, neither, pi, neither zero nor pi. I choose it to be pi halves. Now... I'm going to do, as I said, the five antenna problem later this morning and you can create very clever effects and you'll see like a, an antenna has usually got five poles, ten poles. I mean, you look at a TV antenna, it's got a lot of poles, hasn't it? It's got lots of stuff. 
and, uh, and you can choose to the wavelength of driving each one of the poles. And if you're very clever, you can send loads in one direction and very little everywhere else. But that's, um, that's engineering, so we won't bother too much with that. So, um, the other big thing is, again, all I've got to do is square that formula that I made for... Uh, and again, I, I've done it now in, in the general case. Um, this is the formula for the square. This is the intensity or the irradiance of the light. Uh, in the general case, a, a, A1 and A2 don't have to be equal. We could have different amplitudes to the oscillations, but it's a very simple formula, and it's derived in Hecht by just adding two complex exponentials. All you've got to do is add up A1 e to the i omega t with A2 e to the i omega t plus phi, where phi, excuse me, are omega t plus phi 1, if you use this, and omega t plus phi 2. And it's, uh, again, very straightforward maths. Now, again, the reason this is called interference is that if we just didn't have any interference, that would always be the resultant amplitude. This is, this is sorry, the resultant intensity. This is the intensity from antenna 1. This is the intensity from antenna 2. And we have this so-called interference term. Now, again, that's typical of the difference between physics and general language, is in general language, we normally think of interference as something destructive. You know, we in, you know, interfered with me and this kind of thing. As I, I was trying to get into the penalty area, the defender interfered with me. You very rarely think of constructive interference in, uh, in general language, but if, in physics, um, we do. Now, the next bit, which I'll develop more later this morning, is this representation in phasor diagrams. Now, this is meant, it's used in HECT, used in most optics books, it's meant to simplify the addition of waves. And my experience in the last two or three years of taking the course is that it causes more problems than it's worth. However, I've got to teach it to you because if you want to look at an optics book, it's used. And um, uh, the phasor diagram, I should emphasize, is just a pictorial way of adding up waves. There's nothing else to it. It's just a pictorial way of adding up waves. So this equation can be obtained geometrically by phasor addition. This is kind of noddy and big ears have not studied complex exponentials. They don't know any trig formulae, and they want to do optics. And uh, it, it, there is a terrific irony in this that everybody finds the phasor diagrams more difficult than adding up two waves in maths. However, this is how it works. The idea is that I represent the wave one by, I start at the origin, and there is my amplitude of the wave, and there's its phase. Yeah, this is, all that I'm representing here is e to the i omega t plus phi 1. And it's, or think of it more, let, this one might be easier, as cosine omega t plus phi 1. Maybe this one does work better in the cosines. Now, the cosine is precisely, if you like, the projection on this axis. So, when I add another wave which is rotating at the same frequency. So there's, that's my first wave, my psi 1. My second wave is an A2 cosine omega t plus phi 2. Yeah. Well, I now, relative, I now, there's my phi 2, and there's my A2, which I sort of draw as a vector. <coughs> and then I take a snapshot, if you like, First, think of it as a snapshot, yeah, that the, and I'm just adding A2 cos phi 2 plus A1 cos phi 1. That is just the parallelogram addition of two vectors. And I now get my resultant by this geometric method. It's normally, because the whole thing has got this extra cosine omega t term, <coughs> you could think of the whole diagram rotating around and around the origin at angular frequency omega. But because we're only interested, basically, in the irradiance of the light, 
We don't worry that, about the, the fact that if the waves are in phase, they're always in phase. If they're out of phase, they're always out of phase. So we almost often uh, forget that the whole thing is rotating. Strictly speaking, the entire diagram is thought as rotating counterclockwise with angular frequency. But because we just want the amplitude, we can represent it in this way as a sort of vector addition in the xy plane. It's a purely artificial way of adding two waves up. So don't worry too much about the phasor diagrams. You, they will come in useful to us in some more complicated... Uh, in Fresnel diffraction, the maths is so hard that actually then having a phasor diagram is quite useful. So it's good to get this picture of what's being done. However, don't worry too much about the phasors at this stage. I'll explain a bit more about how they work later on. It's just a way of adding these two things up pictorially. You add them up by the parallelogram rule of addition, assuming that because they're at the same frequency, the whole diagram is kind of rotating around, and then you can get your resultant amplitude and your resultant phase by a picture. But as you're all good, good enough at maths to add two cosines or exponentials together, we don't need it. it but it does come in useful later for more difficult uh, mathematical problems. So, just finally, uh, this is the last page of the lecture notes on the VLE. Um, if, you, uh, if you want to sort of convince yourself that the method works, just choose this special case, A1 is A2, is equal to just some amplitude A, and then the addition is so easy, you can see how the phasor diagram works in that case. So, um, again, just the, the final point here, this final equation, is saying that in the end, interference of two sources is just summed up in one equation. Equation 1410 solves completely for two antennas of equal intensity. There is some phase difference between the two sources. That can be expressed as the inherent phase difference of the oscillators. Again, you know, whether we're driving up and down at the same time or with a shifted phase, plus 2 pi d sine theta over lambda. If the, if the oscillators are driven in phase, that's the only term, and if it's equal to 2 pi m, an integral multiple of 2 pi, we get this beautiful simple formula that if the oscillators are in phase, and that's 2 pi m, the 2 pi's cancel, d sine theta is m, d sine theta is m lambda. And so straight away, if you know the separation of the sources, and you know their wavelength, you know exactly how they add up at any angle from the sources. The, the angle is usually chosen in this sense that you choose, the, if you like, if the sources are in the north-south direction, you choose the east-west direction to be zero, and then you measure the radiation as a function of angle. OK, well, two-source interference was really easy. Five sources later on gets a little bit harder, but not that much. <coughs>